Well, how many people here today have ever been told that they resemble a member of their family? Hands up. You know, it could be a parent, grandparent, sibling, aunt, uncle, dog, whatever. You know, it doesn't have to be just a physical resemblance either. Personally, I actually don't think there's a lot of family resemblance on my side. And I actually have a, a picture to prove it. Take a look at this picture. Well, this is me and my brother, Jeff. You probably know Jeff. He's the lead pastor here. I'm the small one with the smile, you know, the cute one. And he's the one who's obviously shopped at Byway. Uh, and you know, I think there are some similarities. Don't get me wrong. As long as you're not accusing me of being similar in style or fashion, I'm one happy guy. But there's something really cool about family resemblance. You know, it's neat bumping into people at the mall or at the rink and, and kind of having my kids with me and hearing their immediate reaction of, wow, do they all look like you? Or man, do they all look the same? You can tell who they come from. And you know, personally, I, I don't always see it in them, except for with my oldest daughter. She had a birthday this week and she turned eight years old and I had a number of comments, whether it's on Facebook or just, uh, you know, as people bumped into me in the hallway, just to say how much she looked like my wife. I actually brought a, a picture of them as well, just to, to show you. Uh, take a look at this. This is Tracy, my wife, and our oldest daughter, Eden. And for me, uh, I just think that Eden is the mini-me version of my wife, Tracy. Well, my boys have been uh, bugging me lately, and uh, they've been bugging me about um, a certain color of hair that has been increasingly appearing above my ears. And finally this week, I kind of called a timeout, knowing we were going to talk about this, and I said, hey, listen, you can bug me all you want, but basically what you're doing is you're making fun of a version of yourself about 30 years from now. And I'm not sure you want to do that. But there's obviously some physical similarities to family resemblance. But you know, there's a lot more to this conversation than just physical appearance and physical features, isn't there? There are other similarities as well. Even things like mannerisms that have been passed on through generations or sayings that can be traced back to a, a parent or a grandparent. There's oftentimes when I say something and I can hear my dad saying it. It's kind of crazy. There are emotional tendencies or reactions to various circumstances that are now inherent to who we are and how we feel certain situations. There are behavioral consistencies as well. But maybe the most significant are the relational similarities and the patterns of relating that we've watched and experienced that have become ingrained in us and are a significant influence on how we engage in everyday relationships and how we treat those around us. You know, they're the kind of things that make it cliche to say things like the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. You know, or like father, like son, or, you know, my personal favorite that I use with my wife, you're just like your mother. Obviously, only to be used as an incredible compliment to my fantastic mother-in-law. But in a lot of ways, um, this conversation is consistent with themes that come up when you hear nature versus nurture discussions as well. You know, by nature, I'm hardwired with the DNA of two sets of family, my mom and my dad. And by nurture, I've had family or other influences, you know, guardians, coaches, teachers, mentors, and friends that have played a significant role into shaping me into who I have become and how I behave in relationship. For some of us, this is good news, for the most part. Because the example set for us and our families and the friendships that we've enjoyed have provided a, a very nurturing, positive environment. And that would have been the case for me. I have awesome parents, a great family, and an incredible supportive group of friends that have loved me deeply and provided a real safe environment for me to grow and develop. But for others, the initial thought of this conversation could be triggering difficult or even downright painful emotions because of the patterns of relating that you've witnessed or you've experienced that have left wounds and scars that may feel like they're even unrecoverable. But regardless 
of whether you'd consider your experience, your environment positive or negative, enriching or destructive, I think there are two simple things that are consistent for all of us here this morning. Number one, that we all resemble our families to some degree, both positively and negatively. You know, there are attributes that come through our family, through the nature of us and through nurturing that have shaped us into who we are and how we relate. And number two, we all have a choice about how much we resemble our families, either positively or negatively, moving forward. You know, at this point, I feel it's important um, just to say a couple of things because I think it would be easy for us to, for some of us to immediately move into feelings of uh, blame. You know, we, we would blame our parents, our guardians, our teachers, or a coach. We blame our upbringing for where we find ourselves because it might not be where we thought we'd be at this point in our lives. It'd be natural for you to foster a bit of resentment or bitterness because of the wounds left over that have now found themselves working out in challenges and conflict in your own relationships today. It would be normal, but it wouldn't be productive. See, I know it's a lot less painful to look at a cause rather than take some time to look within. And that's what we want to do, not only this morning, but in this connected series. I talked to my dad uh, this summer as we were hanging out at the cottage about a similar conversation and I, I was sharing with them just as a parent how different this conversation becomes because it changes your perspective because of a couple of key things. First of all, for me, I know that I'm doing everything I can as a parent to nurture uh, the environment for my kids to feel loved and supported and encouraged. But number two, I know that I'm messing that up. And sometimes it feels like every day. You know, and I know that I'm creating patterns for them that they're going to carry on that I just so wish I could change. You know, you do your best sometimes and your best just isn't good enough. It's an incredibly humbling place to be. So rather than this conversation being about blame or bitterness or resentment, what if today we had a different conversation? What if we just took stock of our own relationships and the effects that we are having on those around us? What if this series could cause us to consider a different kind of relationship that has been natural or inherent to us up until this point and allow us to begin or to continue a lifelong pursuit that isn't satisfied with the relational implications of our past influences impacting our current relationships any longer and won't be deterred from taking ownership of our own brokenness because we're too busy harboring resentment or bitterness or anger to those that we perceive caused us this pain. But instead, what if even this morning, this conversation of family resemblance could be done and had in a brand new way? A way that I believe that could really and truly change the way we engage in relationship. This morning, I, I thought that it, there was an appropriate scripture that would kind of set a foundation for the whole conversation of this series and almost be a call to action for all of us. And that's found in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 13. This is what it says. So roll up your sleeves. Put your mind in gear. Be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. Don't lazily slip back into those old grooves of evil doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then. You do now. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with holiness. God said, I am holy. You be holy. For a little context uh, this morning, I thought I would start by telling you a little of my story my journey. Because this whole idea about relational patterns or family resemblance started for me about five years ago. It was in a season when Tracy and I were struggling to get on the same page. You know, after 15 years of marriage, 
we have had an awesome experience. I have an amazing wife and we're normal. We've had some seasons in the last 15 years that have been just plain tough in our relationship. As a side note, it kind of made sense in these seasons of something that uh, we were told in our very first premarital session ever. It's a warning that we were given. It's like the very first thing. We sat down in the pastor's office who was going to marry us. And he kind of leaned back and he crossed his arms and he looked at us. The very first thing he says is, you know, you get married to fight. Immediately I was like, you know, you know wow, that, now that is inspiring. That is, that is life ch- changing right there. Trajectory setting. No, he said again, he said, no, 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 I'm serious. He said, you get married to fight. And obviously he could see the look on our faces, the horror or confusion of the naivety and idealistic nature of who we were all of a sudden getting shattered. And he, and he started to explain, he says, no, listen to me. He says, think about it. And this isn't just for marriage. It's for every relationship. You've got two people that you're trying to connect and bring together. And they have different pasts, backgrounds, different upbringings, different values, different desires, different outcomes. They want different things. They have a different goal in mind. And you're trying to bring those people together. And he said, even think about it from a spiritual perspective for a second. So you have person A. And this person has a sin nature, a natural tendency towards sin. And then you have person B, who also has a sin nature, a natural tendency towards sin, and you're trying to bring them together. He said, it's not a grade six math equation when two negatives come together and make a positive. He said, that's just not how it works. His point was simple. We are all a little bit messed up. And we all have baggage that we bring into each and every relationship, which makes conflict inevitable. And he was trying to challenge us to see our relationship as a necessary tool to be refined in our character and allow God to change us. All of our relationships offer that same challenge and opportunity. So back to five years ago, Tracy and I were engaging in one of those predicted experiences and exercise. We now refer to these seasons as intense fellowship. And in this particular season, as would be common in many of the seasons at our house, my sin nature seemed to be providing a disproportionate amount of the discussion material that was creating issues in our marriage. In all seriousness, Tracy was really hurting, and in a number of significant ways. There's areas where certain behavior of mine repeated over a number of years had just worn her down. Aspects of my character were addressed for what they were. Sin and brokenness. But maybe the most unique part of this particular conversation and this season of our life was something that stood out to me was one more thing, a third thing. I felt a hopelessness and a helplessness that I hadn't before. As I listened to my wife share about the things that she needed from me relationally and in particular emotionally. And at first I really didn't know why I was feeling like that. After hours of conversations over weeks and months, literally auditing our entire conversation to make sure that I had heard what she was trying to say. And through a lot of tears, I still felt lost. And as I look back, I think that was primarily due to the fact that I understood what she was saying. The concepts were clear. My audit was detailed. I made buckets, you know, brought them back. Is this what you're saying? I really want to understand. I want to make changes. I want to be different. So what she needed from me was obvious. The hard part was that I had never seen or experienced the things that she was asking for in relationship before. And like I said, I I had a fantastic upbringing and a really supportive family, great group of friends. But like every family, we showed each other love in a way that was unique to us, that was normal for us. The problem in my situation was that that didn't express love in the way that Tracy needed to receive it. And I had no context and no idea 
how to make the changes that were essential for my marriage. And really did just feel totally helpless. Fast forward a few months later, still processing this stuff deeply and still talking through uh, with Tracy, I found myself at a small group leader conference in Chicago. And they had a, you know, a track on the very first day that you could sign up for that was specific to pastors and was an all-day workshop type thing. And the workshop that caught my eye was called the Emotionally Healthy Church by a guy named Pete Scazzaro. I had never heard about him before that day. He'd also written a book by the same title. So I signed up. And I bought the book in advance. And on the way there, on the plane, I started to read it. And I, I, I couldn't put it down. Because what he was talking about was pretty much exactly where I was at in my own relational journey. Thinking through things like family resemblance and you know, how it's normal to have similar uh, you know, behavioral tendencies and emotional responses as our families, extended families, and our significant influences. But that day, when I sat under Peter's teaching, he read through and unpacked two specific scriptures that launched me into a new relational a journey, a new areas of growth for me that are still ongoing today. But it was almost for me like it was a line drawn in the sand. And it, I look back and it was really a spiritual marker, a time where I can see the hand of God really changed me in specific ways. So I wanna read those things for you and hopefully as we unpack them, they could be a line in the sand for someone here today as well. First passage was found in Numbers chapter 14. And it starts in verse 18. It says this, the Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. But he does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sin of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. So in the Old Testament, there were statements that God makes like this in a number of places. Sometimes in the church circles, we call this the concept of generational sin. And what it does not mean is that every time you kind of tell a lie or make a mistake, you know, your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids are going to pay for it. See, in the Old Testament, it was specifically addressing um, a pun uh, sins, Israel's sins getting punished and a specific sin, the sin of idolatry. See, the Israelites had made other gods, which led them to a way of life far from the one that God had invited them into and clearly outlined for them. See, God's desire for them and for all of us was that they would, there would be no other gods before him, no other priorities before him, that he would be the one, that we would follow with our whole heart and every aspect of our lives. You know, but in making that choice to have other things of equal or even greater importance, um, the Israelites, just like us, deviated from the moral, the social, and even the relational instructions that God had given them. You know, God was clear with the Israelites that when we make those types of decisions, those choices to deviate from God's design with how we live our lives and how we treat those around us, that has impact on those that we are relating to. The entire family is affected, even to the third and fourth generations. Frankly, I actually don't think this concept is all that complicated. I think we get it. Our sin, our brokenness, experienced by those that we relate to, affects them, sometimes deeply. I don't think it's just a warning or an implication for parenting or biological family life. I think we get this in friendship and in relationship in general, that our sin has consequences. When our nature and character doesn't line up and reflect God's heart, people can get affected. And sometimes that can have long-term effects. The second passage that Pete read that day after you unpack the Numbers 14, it was found in Exodus chapter 20, second half of verse five. It's a very similar start, but listen closely to what this passage says. I, the Lord your God, 
am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commandments. The sin, the parents, affects the whole family, even for generations, three or four generations. But God's unfailing love is lavished for a thousand generations to those that follow and obey his commands. And that's when it began to hit me. There was a very simple, yet a profound challenge thrown out that day when we were asked to consider what generational impact we were currently having on those that we loved and were building relationship with. So the question that day didn't have anything to do with looking back on those who had impacted me, but rather how I'm impacting others as I'm living out the patterns that I've inherited. Or, there's another option. The ones that I've created, the patterns that I've created, to rebel against my parents or upbringing or other relationships. Because really, there is, that is a second alternative. We repeat what we've seen or experienced, or we rebel and do the opposite, which can be equally destructive. But the question that haunted me and still does today is whether or not we would rather be three or four generation people whose brokenness, even if it's unconscious, continues to be passed to the next generation or whether or not I'm gonna choose to be a thousand generation conduit for God's unfailing love and his blessing to be poured through my life into the relationships that God has blessed me with. And it was, it was clear to me on that day that how I was wired and some of the things that I was struggling with, my nature, maybe what I had learned or adopted as my relational values weren't necessarily the full picture of how God would want me to engage in relationship. And I could have had a couple of responses you know, I could have just been honest and said, you know, this is just who I am. You know, this is how I was wired. This is how I was made. And you've got to accept me just for who I am and the way I am. And we could have probably survived. Or at least I hope we could have. Or I could have acknowledged my own brokenness and the deficiencies and begin what I now know is a lifelong journey of waging war on areas of my heart and relational life that were imp impacting those that I cared about most in a negative way and begin to make a change in order to not just survive relationship, but thrive and enjoy all that God has to bless me through them. This is a very difficult conversation. Just like you know, the apple doesn't fall from too far from the tree is a cliche that's generally true. So is you can't teach an old dog new tricks and a leopard can't change his spots. This conversation and this line in the sand is not for the faint of heart. And there are many of us that could feel pretty discouraged by the state of certain relationships that we find ourselves in. Broken because of the effects and pain that we've caused. Or maybe we're just lost or helpless, like I've shared a little bit. Because you just don't know what it would actually look like to make the changes that you need to make in order to relate in new ways. But for me, I, I believe that there's hope. I believe that there's hope for your marriage. As we begin to make some of these internal decisions about being the kind of person that God has created us to be, I believe there's hope to rebuild those relationships with our kids that have been fractured because of our brokenness or our sin or our mistakes. I believe there's hope to restore friendship and relationship and business partnership. I believe there's hope to restore our hearts to the way that God designed us to live. 
So where do we go from here? And what would it look like to engage in a new journey of family resemblance? Well, there are a few passages that I'd like to, to walk through that I hope can be a challenge and an encouragement as we begin this journey together in this series. If you have a Bible, you could turn to Romans chapter 12. And I'm gonna read from verse two, where it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be transformed. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I love the start of that verse. Don't copy the behavior and custom of the world. You don't have to reflect and resemble the life that you used to live. See, we don't have to be and do what we've always been and done. In fact, to do that would actually be the opposite of the teaching that is central to the gospel. Because Jesus Christ died and then he rose again so that you and I didn't have to be who we've always been and do what we've always done. But instead, we could actually be a brand new person transformed more and more each day into the person that who would reflect God's nature and character to a lost and broken world and impact our relationships in new ways. I love in 2 Corinthians chapter five, how Paul reminds us of this incredible truth of a fresh start that's available for each and every one of us, even today. He says in verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. That old life is gone. A new life has begun. God wants to give each and every one of us a fresh start, a new life, one that resembles not your family of origin, but his family, regardless of whether or not your experience up until this point has been positive or negative. We have been invited to be bearers of God's image to the world. Our family of origins, our own relational history or baggage does not define our resemblance and our identity any longer. But by the person of Jesus Christ, we have been freed from our hurts, our habits and our hangups and empowered by his very presence within us, by his spirit to allow us to live a life that reflects a new family resemblance, his family resemblance, and bear his image to the world. The big question for all of us this morning is whether or not we've been satisfied or content or maybe even just complacent in our relationships to just continue the way of relating that is most comfortable with us, that's natural to us, based on our wiring and our history, or whether or not you would join us in the pursuit to be transformed from the inside out into the people that God has always dreamed that we could become, resembling him to a world that so desperately needs to know of his love, his acceptance, and his grace. And I believe that the primary way that they're going to experience those things is through a different kind of relationship with you and I. As I reflect on the two realities, the two statements that we read at the beginning, number one, we all resemble our families, both positively and negatively. And number two, we all have a choice about how much we resemble our families, either positively or negatively. And it's positive as our upbringings may have been, and as grateful for the influences in our past that we are, there are decisions that we need to make. There were decisions that I needed to make in order to become a thousand generation person rather than a three or four generation one. See, for me, five years ago at that time, there were a few key things that I knew God, had need, God needed to make new in me. You know, dealing with things like my temper, you know, or issues of control. But 
probably the main one that's been the toughest battle and the one that I know I need to wage, wage war on the most is, and what kind of made me feel so helpless in those seasons was learning how to appropriately express myself and use words to show love, to build into relationships, to compliment, to encourage, to express love and affection verbally, to do what Paul encouraged in Ephesians, to use our words to build up, to make strong rather than to tear down. For you, it could be identifying other things, things like impatience or impulsiveness, or maybe being negative, or maybe heart issues, like dealing with stuff like lust, or judgmentalism, anger, or many more. I'm not sure what it is for you. But as you survey or begin to think about the patterns of your relational lives, the deficiencies and the sin tendencies that have caused conflict in your life, and we're gonna take some stock and do some work in just a little bit with your location hosts, to actually take some moments to consider that. But perhaps you can begin to identify some areas this month that you're gonna join me to wage war on so that God can make us new in the way that we relate. And you know, you may never have considered the relational patterns of your past and how that affected you. And to be honest, that's not the part of this conversation that I wanna get stuck on. For me, it was helpful to audit in order to have an accurate picture of where specifically I felt God needed to change me so that I could be a difference maker. Not so that I could be bitter or harbor resentment or get back on somebody, but so that I could be inspired to process my new identity in Christ and what that ultimately meant for the way that I move forward as a representative of his to a lost and broken world, not a representative of my earthly family, not any longer, but of him, the one who saved me from my past in order to give me the resources that I need to have a different future, a brand new life and relationship. Learning how to relate to my family, to my friends, to the world in the way that he has related to me. Learning about his unconditional love, being an example of his acceptance of his immediate forgiveness, of his unending grace, of his amazing compassion to the broken, and of his heart that always wants what other people need, not selfishly looking for their own gain. See, that's how God has treated me and how we are to be challenged to engage in relationship with the world. Regardless of your past, regardless of your age, your stage of life, Would you join me on a relational journey this month to pursue the kind of connection that God has designed us to enjoy? See, this next month, we're gonna take a look at this whole idea of family resemblance and really consider what it would look like to relate as a member of God's family, not just my own. Hope you'll join me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, first and foremost, we say thank you for giving us the amazing privilege to be a part of your family. Thank you so much that you have included us in a part of your plan to be an example to a lost and broken world of what it really looks like to be in relationship with you. God, we open up our hearts to you even right now. And if we need to be broken, we ask you to break us. If we need to be disciplined, we ask that you would do that. But all of us sit before you and cry out to you, begging to be changed so that we can live a life that reflects your family, not just our own, so that more and more people can see you for who you are through the way that we engage in relationship. Help us to do that. For Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen.